Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Let us bow down our heads and feel the presence of our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your blessing. We thank you that you are a holy and all-knowing and all-wise and everlasting and ever-living God. We come to you, O Lord, now, realizing of our, our iniquities and our failings and knowing that we are unable to understand the great truths of your word apart from your divine blessing, apart from your divine revelation to us. So we ask that you would look on us and have pity on us and fill our hearts with understanding through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may you use me today to speak your word so that all glory will be for Christ alone. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The words that I would like to bring your attention to this morning can be found in the book of John in chapter 7 from verse 14 and following. But before that, by way of introduction, I would like to read from verses 1 all the way to verse 18. And the reason for which is so that we can have a context, so that we can have a understanding of what the story is all about. You may follow with your um, Bible. You may follow also in the screen. It will be displayed for you. Otherwise, you may listen. And I will be from the English Standard Version of the Bible. We start from verse 1 in chapter 7. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but, the time is alway but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. In verse 10, But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for, the, for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. And now in our main verses from verses 14 to 18. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Let he who has ears to hear, hear the word of the Lord. The title of our sermon this morning is The Glorious Credentials of Christ. The Glorious Credentials of Christ. What does it mean to have credentials? I like the picture that I saw that illustrates this very briefly and very vividly. The quote in this picture says it like this. He says, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. If you think that hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. And in that, we understand that credentials are something that is to be desired. It is something that we who are um, in the professional world want because of the, thing, the things that come with it. When a person has credentials or when the person has qualifications, 
they are expected to perform in a certain way. Certain things that are able to be done by these people with credentials are expected to come about as compared to those who are amateurs. Because amateurs, quite frankly, they, they really don't know what they are doing. And when we think about that, we think of the amount of value we place. Sometimes you wonder to yourself, especially in, in uh, construction, why is it um, that the managers are paid so high, but those who have relatively no educational background, like laborers, they tend to be paid so low? Why are supervisors given more responsibility uh, uh, in compared to those who are not supervisors? Why in education, when it comes to school, um, you would expect that teachers with a doctorate or a master degree would be more qualified to teach those who are of a lesser um, standard. And I think the, the value of that is because the expectation that we get for people who have this kind of education is quite high. We are paying for their knowledge. We are expecting the things that they will be teaching are very, very important and that they can be helpful. Now, this is extremely important when it comes to the things of God. Would you agree? When it comes to the things of God, when it comes to theology, we cannot be wrong in certain things. Let me put it in another way. The Bible teaches that if you get certain things wrong about Jesus Christ, you will end up in hell. So it is extremely important. It is incumbent upon all of us to be extremely careful when it comes to the Word of God. When it comes to teachers of the Word of God, in this church and in many churches likewise, it is not necessarily a requirement to have a man of doctorate theological degrees. Not necessary. Because we have the Bible. And at the same time, we have people who are aware. It is not a requirement, but the requirement is that the man speaks from the Spirit of God. Nevertheless, we are not anti-knowledge. Please do not get me wrong. If there are people who have these degrees, these are helpful. And nevertheless, we are all in a plain, um, how shall we say, it? level ground because the word that they are teaching and the word that we are expounding as lay preachers is still the word of God himself. Now with that in the background, I want to talk about what is going on here. I'll tell you why I mentioned all of that as a way of introduction in a moment. But let me give you a brief background of what's going on here. This is actually in the second year of the Lord Jesus' ministry here on earth. You see, he spent three years, and in all these three years, he went to Jerusalem three times. And on this particular occasion, which is the second time, it was on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what is the Feast of the Tabernacles? And the Feast of Tabernacles speaks of the time when the Jews were required to go to Jerusalem which is one of three great feasts. This third and last feast of the year, which is approximately around September and October, it is in this time that the Jews were required to go to Jerusalem to commemorate the 40 years that the Israelites spent in the Israel, rather in the uh, wilderness during the wanderings, those 40 years um, in the time of the book of Exodus. If you recall, at the time, there were approximately 2 million people walking in the desert. And at that time, you think logistically, it is impossible for people of that magnitude, logistically, to have a lot of food and a lot of water. It's very difficult. I mean, for just 100 people, it's very difficult to provide food and water. How much more for 2 million people? Now, we have to understand that through this feast, we are reminded, or rather the Israelites at the time, the Jews specifically in Jerusalem, were reminded that God was faithful. Let me give you a visual of what it looks like in this particular feast. The people were required to make booths. What is a booth? It's not the shoe. It's not a female shoe. It is a house, a small house. You think not like a tent, but rather a square-shaped um, 
um, space where they would make uh, a small roof which was not fully covered. They would put uh, trees and vines all on top of the roof. They would leave space for it to be open so that they can visually see the sky above during the nighttime. They would invite people to eat with them during the night and they would also place it in the streets or on top of the roofs where the roofs were flat. They would place these booths on top of those roofs. They would also invite people to remember in those tables. They would discuss about what the Lord had done on those 40 years. There was also a time in that feast where they would take water from the uh, from the pool called Siloam, a very memorable pool, if you remember that. The pool of Siloam, they would take water and they would take it all the way to the temple where the um, altar of sacrifice was and they would pour out water. And this was symboliz symbolizing that the Lord had given them water in the desert. So they were remembering how God provided for them for 40 years while they were in booths by making this tabernacle or this small space where they would stay for eight days, mind you, and they would also remember the water that God had provided. Now this is very interesting because it is in this setting that the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching in verse 14. But specifically, let me preface this by making you understand what was going on at the time. You see, last time that the Lord Jesus Christ was in Jerusalem, he had caused a stir. You recall the teaching of uh, our brother and uh, a few weeks ago when he talked about how a man was made whole on the Sabbath day. And it was in that time that the Jews, when they saw that this was done on the Sabbath, they began to hate Jesus Christ because they thought that he was breaking the law. Now, fast forward six months before the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see this scenario. The Lord Jesus Christ was invited by his brothers to go to Jerusalem and make himself known. Now, obviously, this was not because they wanted him to uh, be glorified and crucified, but because they really didn't believe him. That's what it says in verse 4. And in fact, verse 5, it says, for not even his brothers believed in him. So here we see that the Lord Jesus Christ prudently says it's not his time so he's not going to go to jerusalem however because he obeyed the law and because he obeyed the will of god he still went in his own time and it's very interesting and it's very important to realize this uh, route that he took was not the regular route of people who were traveling from galilee to jerusalem which was where jesus was now the significance i want to point out here is this jesus christ when he went to jerusalem knew full well in six months' time he would be tortured and crucified. You think about going up to a place where you know you will be killed. You will be tortured brutally. You will not be shown mercy. Nails will be driven in your hands and in your feet. And you think about going to that place. If you can go, then you are a very brave man. The Lord Jesus Christ willing to obey the words of his father, did go. But on this occasion, it would not be his death, so he knew his time, or the time of the Jews had not yet come. We now move into verse 14, and here we will see something very interesting. The Lord, in verse 14, says, rather it says here, about the middle of the feast, meaning, we remember I said a while ago, it was an eight-day feast, the Feast of the Pernicles. People were all joyful all around, in the middle of that, the Lord Jesus Christ appears. The question is, why did he come on the fourth day? And the answer is quite simple. Because remember that the Jews were trying to kill him. And in order to avoid being killed up earlier than the appointed time of the Father, he comes in a time when there is a lot of people who will be listening, and that through this thick amount of people, the Jews would not be able to capture him very easily because they would be fearful that the people would start a riot. So we see here, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up. Where did he go? He goes into the temple and began teaching. Now think about it like this. It's a very big open space. The Jesus Christ having his face covered as he walks, and then he sits down, unveils his face, and starts to teach the people. The temple guards, the Jews are all caught 
by surprise because they've been looking for him. Nobody knew where he was. Nobody understood what was his plan. And now he reveals that he was there and they cannot do anything now. They cannot even capture him because later on we find even when the Jews commanded the temple guards to capture him, the temple guard says, nobody speaks like this man. We were unable to capture him. We see that in the rest of chapter 7. But here we now see that he began teaching. This is very important. We don't specifically know what his teaching was. It's not explicitly said here. But by looking at the previous chapters and through the other Gospels, we can have a pretty good idea of what he was teaching. The kingdom of God. Repentance of sin. Faith in the Son of God. Jesus Christ. Like any good teacher, the Lord would have probably taken the opportunity of this particular feast to teach on spiritual truths. What do I mean? I mean to say that if the occasion was about fields where there would be farmers planting seeds, the Lord would have given his very famous parable, which is about the seeds being planted on the uh, bare ground and the fertile ground. You remember that. That's found in Matthew. Now, if it was on a feast of tabernacles, by which the meaning of the feast of tabernacles was about Jesus Christ himself, meaning all of these images talked about his, uh, the Son of God, then therefore you could expect very highly and with a very good probability that Jesus was teaching about this topic as well. And we have a hint that this is in fact the case when we look down in the very last verses, um, in verse 37 of the same chapter, he says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, what does that mean? When you look at this verse, you remember that Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is the water of life that was in the desert. So we see the Lord Jesus Christ taking occasion of this feast to teach spiritual truths and it is also applicable to us as teachers of God's Word as well when you see certain uh, events in the lives of people you can use those as stepping stones to teach on spiritual truths now albeit this is not the main point of our discussion in our sermon we will move on so we understand that it was the middle of the feast there was a lot of people listening this is the setting in jerusalem six months later he would be crucified he is teaching on the truths of the gospel on the truths of god he is teaching that we will need to see jesus for a, uh, for who he truly is and now the jews in verse 15 we are now in verse 15 we see the Jews are now mentioned. Who are these Jews? These were the scribes, the Pharisees, these people who a few months earlier were so angry at the Lord Jesus Christ that they wanted to kill him. And now we see that nothing has changed. They still are angry and they still are wanting to kill him. He says here in verse 15, the Jews therefore marveled. We'll stop at that word marveled. The simple meaning of this word marvel is that they were amazed. Now what were they amazed about? And the answer can be seen in the rest of the verse, but let me tell it to you right away. They were amazed because of the great teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ gave. You remember I said a while ago, if you read toward the end of this chapter, even the temple guards would say, no man spoke ever like this man. This man is special. This man gives an amazing teaching. Something about this man is different from other teachers. You see, at this time, it was not uncommon for rabbis, for the Pharisees themselves, to go out and teach people in the same manner that Jesus was going to teach. The amazing thing, though, is that the manner by which the rabbis would teach, the Pharisees, they would teach by quoting other rabbis. I'll give an illustration. You are not supposed to do this on the Sabbath because rabbi said such and such. Rabbi so-and-so said that this is that and that is this. So, in other words, the authority of those Pharisees when they taught was the authority they got from previous teachers of the law. I remember, rather we remember during our previous pre sermons where we learned about how the 
Pharisees had their own different books. We had the, heard of the Mishnah, we had heard of the Talmud. All of these different books were commentaries that were written by different rabbis on certain subjects. And in the same manner, that's where they got their answers from. They weren't relying on the word itself, but rather they were relying on what was previously taught. Now, in one sense, that isn't really that bad. If you quote from a, a commentator, it isn't necessarily bad. But in this particular context, Jesus Christ shows, rather the people here, the Jews, they were marveling because Jesus Christ spoke with an authority that was not of the rabbis. Put it another way. When Jesus Christ would teach, he was not teaching by saying, such and such rabbi said this, or so and so rabbi said that, therefore you must believe. Instead, Jesus Christ spoke directly with authority. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Stop. He did not say, this is because so and so said it and so and so said it. Did you notice the difference? There is a key difference between the way the Pharisees would teach and the way that Jesus Christ would teach. And therefore, the Pharisees were amazed. This was truth. The things that were taught were true. But we will see in the next verses something very strange. See what he says next. The Jews marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Is this a comment that is a compliment or is it an insult? My dear brothers and sisters, let me say it in another way. You are telling the truth. However, how can you tell us the truth if you've never been to university? The word for learning here is the Greek word gramma, grammata, which is where we get the word grammar from in our English language. We have the word grammar. You remember that. The word here essentially is saying the word, the letters themselves. They are insinuating that how is it possible Jesus Christ could even write words, let alone teach, Nev having not been to our rabbinical schools. Is this a compliment or is this an insult? My dear brothers and sisters, these men were insulting the Lord Jesus Christ. They... Now we'll ask ourselves why. Why would they attack him in this way? Think about it. I am telling the truth and you cannot disprove me. I am giving you the right instruction and you cannot counter my teaching. Jesus Christ gives perfect analysis and exposition of the word of God and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of them have their mouths completely shut. Why can they not attack him? Because the words are true. They realize they cannot argue with him from the standpoint of the word of God because Jesus Christ is perfect in that regard. So what do they do? And this is a very common argument, a way that people fight. Take note, brothers and sisters, listen to these words. When you are in front of a person who will not be argued with what you're saying, the next thing that they will do is they will argue against your character or your credentials. Do you hear me? Listen. You will notice this when you are facing people who are going to go against you and say that Jesus Christ isn't real, that you are a Christian, but you are not teaching us the right things. Why? Because they will attack your character or your credentials. Who's ever experienced it? Sharing the gospel with someone. Beginning. You're telling about sin and righteousness and judgment. And then they say, why are you telling me this? You're just a hypocrite, just like me. You're also sinning. You're also drinking. You're also looking at pornography. Why come to me and tell me about Jesus Christ? You're just a hypocrite just like me. What's the problem? The argument is not that the message is wrong. Do you hear me? The message is fine. But they will attack the person bringing the message. You see the point? They're attacking the credentials of Jesus Christ. 
see in this verse, he's saying, how can you claim to teach the word of God? Okay, your word is good. We marvel. But how can you claim that these words are indeed true when you've never gone through the rabbinical schools? You see, back then, for a rabbi to become a rabbi, they would need to go through a school of rabbis. You would have one rabbi master and you would be following him. And that rabbi would start teaching you until the time when he would move on and you would be the next rabbi and you would have other disciples like your master before. And here he's saying, you've not been to our rabbinical schools. You don't have the credentials to teach. It's a very bad argument. It's below the belt. Do you agree? Brothers and sisters, if you agree, then you will understand the reason why Jesus Christ gives his defense. Now, listen here. We are going to tackle the glorious credentials of our Lord Jesus Christ. How does the Lord Jesus Christ respond to this insult? He does it in three ways. The first way we will see in verse 16. And I want you to take note of this. What we're going to be trying to do here is we will be looking at the way he counters the question or the insult, the accusation. We will also look at the modern principle on earth. Then we will see the principle of God. We will look at verses that help to support that and we'll see our own application for our lives. The first credential that the Lord gives us is found in verse 16 and it is the credential of divine revelation. If you want to write that down, you're free to do so. The credential of divine revelation. What is the meaning of the word revelation? When we talk about revelation, it isn't necessarily the last book of the Bible. We do know that it is the book of Revelation. But the word revelation itself simply means that it is something that is revealed. It is not something that you seek after. It is not something that you can gain. But it is something that is revealed. It's just like, uh, as, just as an illustration, when you're coming to a birthday party and you come and you're trying to look for a person who's hiding because you know there's going to be a party but you don't find anybody. How will you know that there is a party or that there is somebody who's going to surprise you? When they reveal themselves and start saying happy birthday. Just a simple illustration. The difference between self-exhortation um, to get something and the difference between receiving a revelation. So, the point I'm trying to make here is that the first way that the Lord counters this accusation is by showing him, the people who are listening, that his credential is that of divine revelation. It says in verse 16, So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Listen carefully, brothers and sisters. I don't know if you caught this, but this is an insult to them. Listen to the way the argument goes. The Jews were accusing Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you are not worthy to teach in this place because you are not of university. You have no theological training. You are not worthy to be a teacher and not worthy to be a rabbi. What is the response of Jesus Christ? My dear brothers and sisters, an amazing counter. Listen to how it happens. He says, my teaching, indeed, is not from your schools. I agree. My teaching, at the same time, is not mine. Because the accusation includes in it the idea that if you're not teaching from our school, then you are teaching false things. You are teaching dangerous things. You are teaching things that can lead people astray. You might even be what we call a sorcerer, a witchcraft person. You might be teaching those kinds of things. Jesus Christ says, it's not even from my own thoughts. And this is amazing. And then he says, but it is the teaching from him who sent me. Hallelujah. Listen, I don't know if you can get the point here. The point is that he is saying, my teaching doesn't come from your school. It doesn't come from me. It comes from God. And by saying this, he slaps their face. How does he slap their face? It's because what he's saying in effect is your teaching as well does not come from heaven. 
Did you hear me? Did you understand that point? Very important. Listen. The accusation that they were having is, Jesus Christ, your teaching doesn't come from our schools. He says, it doesn't. It comes from heaven. And because you don't agree with me, your teaching does not come from heaven. Can you see the insult that he has given to these people? It's a very sharp rebuke. And they should accept it humbly, but they won't. This is such a sharp rebuke because it reveals to them that it is not by the amount of knowledge that they have that they can claim to teach on God's authority. The modern principle we have nowadays is that in order for someone to be able to teach, they must have a certain level of credentials. The credentials that a person has will help to determine how well they can teach or how well they can work in a certain environment. This is what I was saying in the introduction. In this particular instance, however, the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, your credentials, Pharisees, I'm putting into question now. The source of your learning is from fellow human beings. But the source of my teaching is from above. Such a powerful statement. Such a powerful word that was spoken in humility. Because he is not claiming any glory to himself. He's claiming that the teaching that is amazing that you marvel at is from him himself. God himself who sent me, the Father. This is such an important thing because it shows us that in terms of theology, when it comes to the Bible, everyone is in even playing ground. Now, please, don't get me wrong. I do not mean that we are not to study the Bible, that we are not to pursue a degree in theology, or that we are to completely ignore knowledge. We are not against knowledge. Jesus Christ is not against knowledge. But what he is saying is the ultimate source of truth should not be fellow human beings, but rather the written word of God. God has revealed his will and his word to us through this Bible. And therefore, even an experienced theologian can teach and I can teach, even if I'm a lay minister, because I have the same revealed knowledge that is from God. I hope that is clear. We now see the principle of God in that all of us, when we speak, must speak from His Word. And the application for us is to say that we teach, or rather to do teaching directly from God's Word. Let me quote some verses that show that indeed Jesus Christ spoke truthfully when He talked about having his doctrine directly from God. We see in the same book, in John chapter 8 and verse 28, we see and read. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own authority, but take note, speak just as the Father taught me. An amazing statement. He says that his teaching comes directly from God. The revealed word of God is where he teaches from. That is his ultimate authority and that he says in this verse he doesn't speak anything else but what God the Father has taught him to speak. Let's look at another place. In John chapter 12 in verse 49 we see it here. It says, For I have not spoken on my own authority. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ emphasizing that he doesn't speak from his own self or his own thoughts. But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Now this is again amazing because here we understand that everything that Jesus Christ says are directly from God himself. Think about it. When the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, this is specifically coming from God the Father himself. 
And so we can see that that credential gives him great credibility and that we are to believe because it is revelation of the reality that we as human beings cannot see, but God himself reveals mercifully. Another place where we can see this principle that the Lord is showing us in chapter 14 and verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Again, the words that I say to you, meaning the teaching that I give, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Again, we see how the Lord Jesus Christ giving a clear credential that everything he says is directly from the Father. Let's go down a few verses in verse 24 of the same chapter 14. It says here, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Again, the teaching of the words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In other words, the word that I am teaching you does not come from me but comes from the Father. Now, some of you might be wondering, why did Jesus do that? Why doesn't he simply speak from his own self? I mean, he is God. Why does he still need to rely on the Father? And the answer is simply this, because he wants that he would give glory to the Father, which we will be learning in a few minutes. And specifically, he sets for us an example. I mean, Jesus Christ willingly came down, stripped off his deity so that he would be fully man with all the limitations of man. He would be thirsty, he would be hungry, he would be sleepy. There would be some things in his own knowledge where he would be, perhaps he could be, it's possible that he could have forgotten certain things. He was human just like us, flesh and blood. And yet, for the power of that he had, it all came from God above. He was also given the Holy Spirit. He also prayed daily and nightly so that he may receive revelation from God. In the same manner, now we as believers in Jesus Christ can follow that example. We pray to God, we study his word, and by that, we have authority to teach. We teach only what is the word of God. How do we apply that in our own life? When we teach anything to anyone, when it comes to the things of God, we make sure that the words that we teach are from God. How do we know they're from God? They are tethered and attached only to the Bible. No more, no less. So we see this great credential of the Lord Jesus Christ, this first credential, which is the credential of divine revelation. Now let us look at the second credential, which we will find in verse 17. We continue by looking at the credential of divine obedience. The credential of divine obedience. Let's look at verse 17. It says here, If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The repeated word, of course, you will notice is the word will. Let's say it again. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Let's substitute Jesus in this story because he's speaking of himself. And of anyone, in fact. If anyone, that is Jesus, will, if Jesus' will is to do the will of God, then he will know whether the teaching that Jesus is teaching is indeed from God. Now, this is another slap in the face for the Jews who were accusing and insulting the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How is that, brothers, too? How on earth are they going to be insulted in what he said? Very simple. The first accusation was, Jesus Christ, you don't have any authority to teach because you weren't from our school. Jesus Christ answers and says, what? I have authority from above. I learned from God and you did not. This second one now is saying to them, if 
you follow the will of God, if your desire is to do what God commands you to do, then you will know that what I am teaching is true. In other words, because you don't know that what I am teaching is true, you are not following the will of God. Do you understand that? Brothers and sisters, this is so important. He has just backslapped the Jews once again. This is an amazing credential. Jesus Christ said, because I am obedient and anyone else is obedient to the will of God, then they will know that this teaching is true. And because you don't know, and you accuse me of giving false teaching, therefore, you are not following the will of God. This is very, very sharp. He's, ex he's again showing that there is only one way for a person to truly understand the will of God, and that is if he is doing it. Now, here is the modern principle. People nowadays, they will do this. I think that in order for my children or for people to understand and do good moral things, they must first be taught it. They must first learn what it means not to steal, not to lie, not to, to do all these bad things, and then they will obey. They will be morally good. Now, there is some truth to that. It is important that we teach people what is the difference between good and bad. But here is the strange thing. The Bible says here, Jesus Christ is saying, in order for you to do good, you must first will. In order for you to understand, you must first desire. That is a completely upside down truth. Think about it. Instead of first understanding the truth and then doing it, what Jesus Christ is saying is, first do it and then you will understand. This is very, very strange. This is an upside down kingdom. The world in itself right now believes everybody by nature is good. But everyone, as our dear worship leader exhorted a while ago, are sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. That is Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And each one of us does not have a desire to obey God. And think about it. If I don't have a desire to obey God, then how will I know that Jesus Christ, what he teaches, is true? It's a very logical argument. Because I don't believe in God, I don't do the works of God, therefore I cannot tell if what God is telling me is true or not. So here we see this great credential. Jesus Christ saying, I obey the will of God. Many other people who believe in my word know that I'm telling the truth because they obey. But since you do not obey, then you will not know the will of God. Let's look at a few more places where this is made clear. In John chapter 8, the same book, we look in verse 31. Jesus says it like this. He said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, meaning the teaching that Jesus gives, you are truly my disciples. Notice he didn't say you are truly with understanding. He didn't say that. He says, if you abide in my words, meaning you willingly obey, then you are truly my disciples. And then in verse 32 it says this, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What comes first? Obedience or knowledge? Obedience. Very strange. Isn't it first that I have to first understand it and then I will obey? No. In this, the Lord is teaching an upside down way. First, be willing to obey. Then you will see the truth. Let's look at another place in the same chapter from verses 43 to 44. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is the exact opposite of what was said in verse 17. Listen to the words in verse 43, when Jesus Christ was talking to people who were thinking of stoning him. Verse 43, 
Why do you not understand what I say? Jesus Christ was speaking, was teaching, and they, then he tells them, why is it that you don't understand what I say? Is it because you don't understand? Is it because you lack knowledge? Is it because you are lacking of education? That's not what he says. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. It is because you do not want to obey. You have no desire to do the things that I command you or the things that God commands you. And therefore, you do not understand. Brothers and sisters, are you a person who lacks understanding in the word of God? Maybe it's because you are not willing to obey. Look at the next verse in verse 44. This is a very scary reality, and I want everyone to check their lives. Why is it that you cannot understand? Because you will not hear, you will not do the word that God has told you to do. And the reason why is you are of your father, the devil. Wow. And your will is to do your father's desires. You see? It's really simple. Either you're doing the will of God or you're doing the will of the devil. There's only two options. And if you're doing the will of God, you will know that what Jesus Christ is saying is true. If you're doing the will of the devil, you will not know what Jesus Christ is saying is true. Last verse to look at. In John chapter 14, verses 21 to 23, or rather 21 and 23, in verse 21 it says, Whoever has my commandments, that's Jesus Christ, whoever has my teachings and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved of whom? Of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Notice that the love that a person has for the words of Christ automatically gives him love from God the Father to him. So that Jesus Christ proves that if indeed you obey God, God then loves you because you are willing to obey the Son. In verse 44, or rather verse 23, sorry, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Powerful words. Again, pointing to the fact that it is incumbent on us to first obey. And after we've obeyed, then we will understand the truth. But you see, he countered the Jews and said, because you don't obey, you cannot understand. You cannot teach from God with authority. We've looked at the first two credentials, the credential of divine revelation, the credential of divine obedience, and lastly, we will now look at the credential of divine glory. The credential of divine glory. Look with me to the last verse that we will be studying tonight, uh, today, which is in verse 18. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. This is the final slap on the face of the Jews who were accusing Jesus Christ of not being qualified. Let's look at the scenario again at by review. The Jews accused Jesus Christ, you are not worthy to teach because you didn't go to our school. Jesus Christ answered, I didn't go to your school, but the teaching I have is from God and you don't have his teaching. Second, the teaching that I am teaching is for those who obey God and you don't know because you don't obey God. And the third is the teaching that I teach is true because I don't teach for my glory. I teach for the glory of him who sent me. And this is a slap the third time because if I teach to glorify him and my teaching is true and yours is false, 
The reason why it's false is because you're teaching to glorify yourself. It's amazing. Are you amazed? I'm amazed. How the Lord Jesus Christ dismantles with three sentences the complete logic of these Pharisees who thought so highly of themselves. He dismantles them and shows them that they indeed were wrong. You see, we can see the principle all around us that many people, they will do good or they will do things by themselves according to their own thoughts and the normal response will be glory to me because it was my idea, because it was my means, it was my ways, therefore it is glory to me. Not the, not the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord teaches from the word of God that was revealed by the Father himself completely lowering himself so that God himself will be glorified. This is so important because we who are preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God, studying for ourselves, we realize that we can take no credit whatsoever. And I say this in front of everyone as well. I myself cannot take any credit for the word of God that is being preached today. It is all him. Why? Whose words are we expounding? God. Whose energy am I using to teach this. It's God who gives me energy. Who should get the glory? Anything that is said here, it is God himself because it is he who is given all this information. You see? Jesus proves that he has authority and credential to teach because when he teaches, it is for the glory of God. It is not for the glory of others. Let's look at a few verses that help to solidify that. In chapter 5 in, chapter, in John's Gospel, in verse 41 to 44, we read, I do not receive glory from people. This is Jesus Christ speaking. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? This is a very sharp rebuke that the Lord gave during the time of his healing of the man who was uh, crippled. The point that he's showing here is if you are going to believe, you must first be willing to receive the truth that glorifies God and not glorifies yourselves. Clearly, in verse 43, he says, If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. It was just like the rabbis of that time. Rabbi such and such says this. Rabbi Ra such and such says that, and that's why we have to believe it. All glory to me, all glory to him. No. Jesus Christ teaches that the Lord said this, Thou shalt not steal, all glory to God. Thou shalt not lie, all glory to God. See the difference. Let's look at one more place in John's Gospel in chapter 8 and in verse 50 we read, Yet I do not seek my own glory. This is again Jesus Christ saying, Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is judge. That's John chapter 8, verse 50. Yet I do not seek my own glory. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ emphasizing that he doesn't do any of this for the sake of himself. He does it for God and therefore proves his credentials. Amazing, really. And how do we apply that in our own life? When we who are going to teach anything to anyone do so, we say glory to God. We give glory to God. We recognize from our hearts that indeed it is God who deserves all the glory because it is his teaching, it is his command, and it is his will for us to do good. And so we've seen how the Lord answered back the Jews by showing us three glorious credentials. Let's review them one more time the credential of divine glory 
and we apply these in our own lives in these ways. Number one, we teach the revealed word of God. We do not teach the revealed word of Satan, nor do we re teach the revealed word of Stu or of any other person. We teach the revealed word of God, and it is the only thing that is authoritative. Number two, we obey the revealed word of God. And by way of expressing this in evangelistic terms, my dear brother and sister, if you are not a believer of Jesus Christ, you will never know the truth of God. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, how must this happen to you? How can you receive the truth of Jesus Christ? First, realize that you're a sinner. Realize that you cannot save yourself. Realize that God has made a way and given provision for you to escape the damnation of hell, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. All you need to do is to obey this. Repent of your sin. Trust in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross, and you will receive salvation. You will be born from the inside, Spirit of God coming down, giving new life, so that after you've obeyed this, then you will come to see the truth of God. You will be willing to obey the will of God. Lastly, we, in application, seek the revealed glory of God. God has revealed His glory in one particular way, in His Word. This particular way that we are to reveal, or rather to seek after, will manifest in our life. Let me give you an illustration. If I do good because I've read the Bible and I've understood the words of the Bible, being obedient, trusting in Christ to follow these, and I do good and people see around me what I'm doing, I am now glorifying God when I say all glory to God because he has given me his word to follow and I trust in him. Here's another thing. If I do bad, then I do not glorify God. Very simple. If I want to do good and glorify my Lord, I obey his word and thereby giving glory to God. And so with these three credentials of the Lord Jesus Christ, I say to every one of us, brothers and sisters, let us believe in him. Let us be sensitive to his word, sensitive to his will trusting that he indeed has the right credentials for us today. He is worthy to be believed. He is worthy to be trusted. In conclusion, let me quote something that I read that was spoken by Pastor John Piper, a very nice um, quote talking about the glory of God. And this is a very good challenge for each and every one of us. Listen well. If you wanted to develop a love for the glory of classical music, you would study it and spend time talking with people who love it. And you would listen and listen and listen. If you wanted to develop a love for the glory of visual art, you would study it and go to museums and spend time with those who love it and you would look and look and look. If you wanted to develop a love for the glory of the sky, you would get a telescope and you would read astronomy and you would spend time with people who love the stars and night by night you would gaze and gaze and gaze. Correct, true. And if you want to love the glory of God who is above all other glories, then you will study God and spend time with lovers of God and listen to God and look at God and gaze and gaze and gaze at the revelation of the glory of God. I pray that we will not be like the Pharisees who judge by outward appearance, who have desire to look upon Jesus with negativity, but that we would be humble and that we would study and that we would have communion with Christ and with the fellow believers so that we may see the glory of God. His credentials are enough. Do you trust him? 
if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, my dear brothers and sisters, now is the time. Take a time, take, you can turn off this, this feed and you can just pray that prayer to the Lord and be sincere. Talk to him. Say that you trust in him, that his credentials are in fact sufficient and you do believe in him. This is your only hope. There is no other way by, by which man will be saved, only by the name of Jesus Christ. Let us bow down our heads and pray and give thanks to the Lord for this glorious teaching. Father, we thank you for revealing all of these things to us today. We thank you that we have learned that everything you say is true. We have learned that everything that you've done proves that you are true and that you have done all for the glory of your name, Lord God of heaven and earth. We are so grateful that you have set forth for us an example to follow. You have done for us the impossible and that through this you have made a way for us to be reconciled to you. Help us now to see your glory day by day in these things that are written in your revealed word. Lord, I pray that each of the ones who are, young ones who are listening to this will be encouraged and inspired to read your word and to trust that you indeed, Lord Jesus Christ, are credible and are worthy to be listened to, worthy to be worshipped. All glory is always and forever will be yours. And this we pray and lift up to you. Through Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. God bless us all.